One of my favorite stories about life after Holy Week and life after Easter for the disciples happens as they are fishing. The story is centered around Peter, who you probably remember didn't have the best response and reaction to the arrest and the crucifixion of Jesus. He denies Jesus three times, and then to make things even worse for Peter, Jesus told him before that that would happen, and Peter promised that he wouldn't deny him. What will happen then when the risen Christ sees Peter next? Here's the story from chapter 21 of John. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood beside the beach, and the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, have you no fish? And they answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. And Simon Peter heard it was the Lord. He put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the lake. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred feet off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with some fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter felt hurt because he said it to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I've been really focused on Easter for a long time you know, many weeks getting ready for the big holiday and Holy Week, as the pastor has a lot to get ready for. And now that Easter has come and gone, I've found myself feeling pretty low energy these last few days. The thoughts of bunnies and baskets are long gone, and maybe it's the crash from the sugar rush from all those Reese's peanut butter eggs, or maybe it's how it keeps snowing outside. Maybe it's just been how long I've been shut in my house. Or maybe it has something to do about the Easter story and Holy Week that is so full of overwhelming wholeness of the entire Christian story and everything that our faith is about that when it's over and done, we can be left feeling a little bit empty. The magnitude of Easter carries so much that when it passes and things return to normal, we have to wrestle with what that means for us. It turns out we're not alone. The disciples had to do the same thing, and the disciples as well had to move on. It's been a little while since they found the empty tomb, and now they've gone back to life as usual, as normal. They've gone back to fishing. All of the disciples, but especially Peter, have certainly been through a lot lately. A lot of emotions, confusion, fear, anxiety, grief, hope. I think what has made this all so difficult for Peter is that Peter had to face his failure. Peter, without question, loves Jesus. He's a committed disciple. He is always eager, always willing. But on the night that Jesus was arrested, Peter denied Jesus three times. What kind of disciple is that? What kind of faith is that? He's feeling guilty. He's feeling like a failure. He's probably feeling overwhelmed. And so Peter returns to what he knows. He gets on a boat with his friends and he casts his net into the water. He's apparently naked when he does this, which is really odd, but you know, whatever. We've all done weird things with our friends before. And 
Certainly Peter's been through a lot, and I guess fishing naked is how he chooses to unwind. I'm sure a couple of you can relate to that, but, you know, please don't tell the rest of us. I remember a fishing trip that I took the summer that Brooklyn was born. We went up north to spend some time at the cabin over parental leave, and I couldn't wait to get out on the lake and fish, but it turns out that caring for a newborn is a little time-consuming. I mean, it is for dads, at least. I'm, I'm sure moms have it pretty easy. They usually do. After a couple of weeks, I finally got my chance to head out on the lake and to check this promising spot on the other side, and I casted my line out, and I was drifting calmly on the water. It was pretty hot, uh, and there was hardly any wind, but it was just relaxing to be out there on the lake. And after a while, the heat was starting to get to me, and I hadn't caught anything, not even something small to toss back, and I was feeling a little bit guilty for spending so much time away from Sayward and Brooklyn, and so I got up to start the motor and to head back, but the motor didn't start. And I tried over and over and over again, and nothing. So after an hour of drowning worms without a single fish, I spent the next 90 minutes rowing the boat back across the lake to the cabin. No matter how you want to define that trip, it felt like a pretty big failure. The only silver lining was when I got home, Sayward had made dinner, but since I had said I'd be back an hour before, it was a little cold. Peter had failed on all fronts, but as he sat in the boat without a single fish, his eyes caught a glimpse of Jesus. And with the eagerness so characteristic of Peter, he leaps into the sea to chase after Jesus. Now, again, it's a little odd that naked Peter puts on clothes to jump into the water, but let's not get distracted by all of the details because what happens when Peter reaches Jesus is the good part of the story. When Peter reaches the shore, you kind of expect Jesus to say something about how disappointed he is in Peter, some kind of scolding, some kind of, hey, I told you so. I said you'd do that three times and you did. That would have been in order. Instead, Jesus says, let's eat. Let's get back to our normal relationship. Let's gather around a table and eat just like we did the night that you betrayed and denied me. Let's get back to what we do. And suddenly, even though he was a colossal failure at it, Peter is back to discipleship. That's the way that God works. God meets us in our failures with the abundance of love and grace, with love and mercy and life that our nets cannot possibly contain. Obviously, you all know now that I'm not a great fisherman, but I know enough about fishing to know that 153 fish, that's a lot. What will they do with all those fish? Well, as it turns out, Jesus has some ideas about that too, and so he tells Peter to feed his sheep. Jesus may be filled with love and grace and forgiveness for his disciples, but this is not his first rodeo. He's been working with these idiots for a while, and he knows that if this group is going to have a chance to do anything, if this group is ever going to hear what he says, he's going to have to tell them to do it multiple times. If you love me, feed my sheep. It reminds them of the mission that they have before them three times. After all, Jesus can't let them go on thinking that their failures make them unable to participate in the mission of God. A couple of years ago, I was on the board of directors for Lutheran Volunteer Corps, and we had a meeting in Baltimore with the leaders of Lutheran World Relief. And one of the reps from LWR discussed their global ministries, and they mentioned that out of their many, many things that they do, their largest ministry has always been their quilt ministry. More than anything else, they are still known for collecting quilts from Lutherans all over America and then sending them out to cold and needy people all around the world. They mentioned, though, that over half of the quilt donations recently came with a letter from the Lutheran quilters. About half of them contained some kind of note that apologized for their quilts. Apologies that this year there were only two quilts in their donation, or we wish we had more quilts, or we're sorry that this year's production is just a little less than last year. Yet somehow, these 
inadequate quilters, these failures, combined to send over $14 million worth of quilts around the world in one year. More likely than not, you have failed at some mission of being a disciple. I know that I have. More likely than not, you feel guilt about some aspect of your life that feels like a failure to you. You may even, like Peter or these quilters, feel guilty, inadequate. But guess what? God is going to be working through you no matter what. Your relationship with Jesus is not dependent on your success rate but rather the faithfulness of Jesus. The kingdom of God still needs you, and if you think that God is only going to be working through your successes and your strengths, then you have seriously misunderstood how God works, because your weaknesses are going to be used for God's mission too. That's what being a disciple is all about. Jesus is calling you to a table of abundance, so leave your guilt and your fear behind and come to this table of an abundant Easter feast. Amen.